Hi everyone, we're just going to get started in a minute. Um, if you are um, new here, welcome uh, to the Material Histories of the Indian Ocean World 1500 to Present Methods and Challenges Seminar. Um, I named it that way and I'm not sure now why I decided to do such a long name for the webinar, but we're calling it IOW Material Histories for short. Um, if you are uh, going to chat about uh, the webinar on um, on the uh, on Twitter or any other places, I would say please use the hashtag IOW Material Histories. I'm just putting that in the chat if you want to copy it. Um, we welcome more uh, discussions and continued engagement um, on our on 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 social media. Uh, you can find me there. I don't think Sarah is on Twitter, but we do have a number of our speakers um, on Twitter. If you would want to uh, talk to them over there. Um, thanks for joining us today uh, for the fourth talk of the IOW Material History series. Um, if you have not attended our previous talks or you would like to revisit them, we do have um, the talks uh, up on our um, website. Um, not on our website, sorry, on our YouTube channel for now. We'll have them on our website momentarily. Um, and I'm putting the YouTube link in the chat window and you can use that to um, access and view our previous talks, um, previous three talks. Um, you can also find details about this talk and all the other talks on our website, iowmaterialhistrieswebinar.org. I have put that link also in the window. So um, I've loaded up the window with a bunch of uh, uh, links. So um, to get started, I would like to introduce uh, our speaker and the topic in discussion today. Dr. Sarah Fee is Senior Curator, Global Fashion and Textiles at the Royal Ontario Museum, Toronto. She is responsible for the museum's renowned collection of 15,000 textiles and fashions that come from greater Asia and Africa. Sarah began her textile research in Madagascar and in recent years expanded to the Western Indian Ocean world. Most recently, she cu curated the exhibition, The Cloth That Changed the World, the painted and printed cartons of India. Um, if you haven't seen the catalog for this book, please, please take a look. It's the most gorgeous um, catalog. <laughs> Um, Doctor, there, there we go. Uh, Doctor Fee teaches in the Art Department, University of Toronto, and is a research associate at the Musée du Quai Branly, Paris. Sorry, I butchered that. Um, today, she is going to talk to us about her ongoing research on regional handcrafted textiles in the 19th century Western Indian Ocean world. This talk titled Weaving Connections Across the Western Indian Ocean in the 19th Century challenges the notion that regional handcrafted textiles that linked Western India, Southern Arabia and Eastern Africa were obliterated by the industrial imitations from Europe um, in this period. Focusing on cloth consumption um, in Eastern Africa, Dr. Fee will demonstrate the regional weavers and weaving traditions uh, demonstrate that regional weavers and weaving traditions continued to flourish in the 1800s. We also have a discussant or moderator for this talk. Uh, Dr. Kristen McKnight Sethi has graciously and generously agreed to be to being a part of this con conversation. Um, Dr. Sethi is an assistant professor of art history at the Corcoran School of the Arts and Design um, at George Washington University. Um, her research and teaching interests focus on South Asia and include the study of textiles and vernacular art, the intersection of gender and practices of making, networks of circulation and exchange, and histories of colonialism and British imperialism. Um, she has held curatorial and research positions at the Los Angeles Co County Museum of Art, the UCLA Fowler Museum, the Asian Art Museum, San Francisco, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Museum of International Folk Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Kristen's a current book project examines gender, labor, and hand embroidery in, embroidery in Punjab during the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, I'm full of uh, typos and uh, pronunciation errors this today, as you can see. Um, I'm going to put one of Kristen's latest publications in the chat in a bit if you want to take a look. Um, and you can find more information also on our webpage for the talk. Um, before we begin, uh, one quick note. Uh, we are very grateful for all of you who have joined and rejoined us uh, for the last three weeks for these talks, fourth week, including um, this week. And we would love to build this community further. And we're going to ask 
uh, request you to do this in a couple of different ways um, if you so um, would like to join us. Uh, one is to obviously en engage with us on Twitter and using the hashtag that I just uh, put in the chat window. Um, the second is we, are, we invite you to write some reflection essays or review essays um, that are really, really short uh, in the post, in like a blog post format for our website. And the third, we're going to continue the energy that we have built here by trying to make these short five minute stories on objects and scholars who study them um, for uh, in, in a YouTube channel format. So if you're interested in any or all of it, please, please, please let me know and um, I will make sure to get connected with you. Um, so that's all the uh, announcements I have. Um, so welcome Sarah and Kristen and everyone here. Uh, thank you for being part of the series and Sarah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much Deepti for the kind introduction. And thank you for organizing what has been a very wonderful series of talks. And I also want to thank everyone uh, for being here today. I know Zoom fatigue is starting to build. So uh, thanks to you as well. Now, sometimes I have this problem. I'm gonna have to stop my share and restart uh, my share. Sometimes uh, my computer just doesn't want to cooperate. So we will do this again. And begin. And here we go. So um, the main uh, part of my talk today is going to be about the making and trades in handwoven cloth in the Western Indian Ocean world in the 19th century. And I know we come to this series of talks from various disciplines and entry points and on different eras and parts of the ocean. So um, many of you probably in the audience are going to be familiar with this map and area and these textiles. And these were some of the most important trade textiles uh, that were circulating in the Eastern Indian Ocean uh, in medieval, early modern and into modern times. Uh, everyone would probably recognize our double ecot silk patola, which you see in the upper left. And then our painted and printed mordant and resist dyed cottons, you know, both coming from India and going into Southeast Asia as part of the spice trade. Um, but I'm going to be looking at the other side of the ocean, the, the western side, um, where some of these trade textiles are a lot less known. I'll be talking uh, a bit about Madagascar, which oftentimes doesn't appear on Indian Ocean maps, although it is quintessentially born of the Indian Ocean. It was settled by peoples coming from both maritime Southeast Asia, continental Africa, South and Southwest Asia. But mostly I'm going to be talking about uh, this wider uh, weaving area of the 19th century and uh, the ports that I've had a chance to look at to date. Um, so this includes um, Manvi in Kutch and Gujarat. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about Zanzibar and the wider Swahili coast and also coastal Oman. Um, my time period of the 19th century, really, I'm going to be looking at 1830 to 90, is also a bit special in this series. Um, this is the full age of industry, we might say, the time when British industrial cottons especially were aimed at export to Africa and Asia. So my research on the handwovens could not help but articulate with discussions on deindustrialization in Asian Africa as discussed by historians such as Titanka Roy, Prasanan Partisarati, William Gervais, Clarence Smith, Douglas Haynes, and others. I found especially valuable the insights of Roy and Haynes that in tracing the fates of handcrafted textiles and artisans who were in competition with European industrial imitations, we have to carefully disaggregate the different types of cloth and recognize that each technological type implies different supply chains, artisan groups, merchants, and consumers. And also that innovation in the 19th century was not the monopoly of industrial manufacturers. Um, you know, if we look closely at the material properties of the handwoven cloth circulating in the Western Indian Ocean in the 19th century, we can better appreciate some of the special techniques and innovations of hand weavers. Um, 
And these are uh, what some of the trade textiles look like and that I'll be talking about further. Um, but this is really a, you know, a, a series talking about methodologies. Um, so I thought I would just get a bit of background of how I came to the, the subject and how I approach um, this research. So um, I actually come to this from ethnology and anthropology. My PhD dissertation was a three year village stay in Southern Madagascar and a very localized monograph on the cloth traditions of one group, the Tandrui cattle herders. Like many groups in Madagascar, they actually live with their back to the sea. And the Tandrui in particular say that God salted the sea to make it taboo to humans. It's not where you should go. So I always try to remember and recall, you know, these processes of authentication and domestication the post-commodity phase of trade textiles, you know, when people are selecting them according to local cosmologies and social needs, they assign new meetings and textile cargoes basically become dress, gifts, and social capital. They're not just a trade medium. You know, that said, if we take the bird's eye historic view, we can see that Tandri textile traditions have strong ties to continental Africa in terms of certain techniques. And more broadly, understanding why Madagascar's textiles look like they do does require reference to the wider Indian Ocean world, particularly in the 19th century. Madagascar's weavers have continually drawn on techniques, materials, designs, and fashions from wider Indian Ocean networks. So after my doctorate as a postdoc project, I undertook an art historical analysis of Madagascar's most iconic textile, which you see here is called Akutifana. And what makes it different from other Malagasy weaver, uh, weavings is in part the fiber, it's entirely made of bombex or Chinese silk, but also these supplementary weft patterning, which I hope you can see these little figures. Um, and it appeared rather suddenly at the start of the 19th century. And so past studies had variously seen it as uh, a slate of religious symbols or colors that existed from time immemorial or a new royal tradition that broke with the past. Um, so to really understand its history and meanings, I found that I had to uh, invoke four kinds of information, texts, um, studies of museums, objects that included dye analysis, um, looking to images, and also field interviews. Now Europeans really before 1880 had nothing to say on it except a hint that it might have been inspired by Gujarati silk imports. And so we are lucky to have copious historic writings by the Malagasy themselves, as you see in the upper right. By the 1850s, tens of thousands of Malagasy were literate and have left a mountain of documentation. In the local manuscript that you see here uh, by uh, a Malagasy man known only as the Umbiasi from about 1860, he tells us squarely that the supplementary wefts um, were not what mattered. They were pure ornamentation. It was the striping patterns on the cloth that gave it its name and its significance and its importance. Uh, the colors, these figures um, were not what were preeminent when the Malagasy looked at them. And that becomes important when we're looking beyond Madagascar. And if we also look at a larger pool of uh, pieces, we see that in fact, the designs were very uh, varied and some cloths that we think or call it Akutifan are in fact the Arusi striping pattern that's been embellished. So you can see there's actually a wide variety in these uh, textiles. And as the Umbiasi tells us, the weaver and the patron could combine colors and patterns however they saw fit. And what I, of course, found in this research too was that some things that we've always thought are unique characteristics of Malagasy weaving actually linked to wider fashion and weaving trends in the Western Indian Ocean world. So uh, in 2015, I applied for a five-year research grant um, from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada to look at the wider interconnected weaving worlds of the 19th century. 
And what I'm sharing today, I uh, what I would call from the first chapter, which I carried out from 2015 to 18. And the main aim in this first step was to identify these cloth types that were circulating uh, into Eastern Africa and Madagascar from about 1830 to 1880 or 90. Now, during this time period, Central Southeastern Africa, which I'll be calling Eastern Africa for short, um, became heavily involved in export trades of elephant ivory, gum copal, human captives, and eventually cloves. These trades had existed since antiquity, but in the 19th century, a new economic boom was driven in part by Europe and America's entry into these trades in search of ivory, largely for piano keys and billiard balls, which have become the new middle class status symbols and a few other products. By the 1860s, as the so-called elephant uh, ivory frontier receded ever further inwards, the trading trails reached further inwards, uh, ultimately as far as Northern Zambia and the DRC. African led caravans originated from the interior, but increasingly Arab and Swahili merchants organized caravans from the coast. From the 1830s, nearly all these products moved through the island of Zanzibar. They were all funneled, everything coming in and out. And as in the spice trade in Southeast Asia and Eastern Africa, what peoples largely demanded in return for these local products were textiles. There were other products, beads, wire, um, and um, some mechanical goods, but it was really primarily textiles. And these were mainly used um, not only as a trade medium, but also for wrapper dress and ceremonial gifting. Regional fa uh, fashions existed, but basically the same kinds of textiles were carried and consumed uh, across this huge swath of uh, Central and Eastern Africa as well as that to the Comoros and Madagascar. So what were these cloths? Um, here is a table of names I will be referring to again and again. Now to date, historians have mainly been interested in one particular type of imported cloth, and uh, that is this unbleached sheeting that was called Marikani. It was industrially woven in Western factories and by 1850 had largely replaced handcrafted Indian unbleached cottons. It was called Marikani because as uh, Abdul Sharif, uh, Jeremy Presthold and others have shown, the cloth was made in American mills, specifically in Massachusetts. American merchants from Salem became active in the Western Indian Ocean trade from the 1820s seeking ivory, gum copal, and cattle hides for New England's growing industries. Heavily invested in Indian Ocean trade, they had New England's textile mills produce coarse cottons in imitation of Gujarati's hand woven. And this Marikani proved an, America, uh, an incredible success. There is no question that in terms of volume and value, unbleached, undyed American cotton sheeting comprised around 50% of textile imports into Zanzibar in the 1840s and 70s. It was used not only as a trade medium, but also for dress, as you can see here, worn as largely as wrapper cloths. Now, a similar fate held for the indigo dyed yardage of Kaniki, which for centuries, Eastern Africa had imported from Western India. Over the course of the 19th century, the base cloth itself was increasingly industrially woven in the UK although the indigo dyeing largely continued to take place in India until 1900. Now, art mm. historians, meanwhile, have focused largely on this type of cloth that was imported into Zanzibar, uh, known as the Leso or Kanga, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. This was a rectangular cotton wrapper industrially printed in the UK, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. It's very appealing to our modern eyes for its bold graphic designs and also for these lovely studio portraits of the early 1900s. The Congo is also largely based on Indian design prototypes, um, but Congo cloths, as we will see, were not that important to fashion or trade until after 1870 and very few traveled into interior Africa before 1880. So we love them today, 
but in the 19th century, uh, up until about 1880, they weren't yet that popular a cloth. So these th three industrial uh, cloths that I have just presented um, and that have been presented as the major imports into Zanzibar might then lead us to think that industrial stuffs had totally outcompeted and obliterated the Asian handcrafted uh, exports to Eastern Africa. But you know, that still leaves all these other cloths on this list. So what are they? Where did they come from? How were they made? What did they look like? That has been the essence of the first part of my research project. And what I found is that they were the luxury trade textiles of 19th century uh, Eastern Africa that were traded, worn and gifted by elites and rulers uh, until the very end of that century and some beyond. The vast majority were striped and checked cottons and silks, hand woven both in India and in Oman. And ultimately I was able to match some names, images and actual examples, but it took several years and much back and forth between the various sources to get there. And again, since this is um, a series of talks really about methodologies, I'm going to just uh, walk us through uh, the sources as I uh, explain uh, how I came to some of my conclusions. So first we have, of course, textual sources. And um, one important source um, are published uh, import and export returns as well as caravan packing lists. Uh, many were published and many of course have now been digitized and are easily uh, available. So in the 19th century, British American and then later German consuls sent yearly trade statistics to home offices and many were published by government presses, including Zanzibar series. But of course, these can only be a first step and uh, going to the actual archival sources are still necessary. Uh, even to um, confirm some of these published sources, I found that this often cited uh, trade return report by uh, General Rigby, uh, by Lieutenant Colonel Rigby, uh, that's often cited. Um, if you go to the actual archival manuscript that he sent, it actually includes a, a lot of other types of textiles that did not make it onto uh, his published list. And all of these consular reports tend, that were published tend to be very high level. The published and unpublished material related to the French explorer Charles Guillain's mission of 1846 to 47 contain a lot more information on local cloth trades. And then there are German sources. If anyone has a question on those, I can comment. Um, incredibly useful are these published packing lists of the European explorers who traveled from Zanzibar into interior Africa in the name of geographic exploration. They include Richard Burton, William Hanning Speak, and Henry Morton Stanley. All include lists or descriptions on the types of cloths they purchased in Zanzibar for trade in the interior. And importantly, they provide the local names. They also, in many instances, uh, recorded uh, descriptions and a lot more information. And they didn't do this, you know, for the ethnographic value. They did it for two other reasons. Um, the first was to help British travelers that they hoped would come after them. These men had learned the hard way that not having the correct type of bead or cloth stopped travelers in their tracks. You know, even though they weren't there as traders, they still needed cloth to buy provisions and to gift to rulers. And, um, you know, late Victorian publications portrayed these men, you know, bushwhacking their way through virgin territory. But we know instead that they were really guided by seasoned Arab and Swahili traders who had helped create the trails decades earlier. They often actually usually rode uh, at the back on donkeys or they were carried in litters too sick to walk. And also, as Jeremy Prestholt has um, so well described, they were hostage to cloth. Each time a caravan entered a new polity, it had to present the ruler with large gifts of luxury cloths of the specific type demanded by that ruler. And talks to agree on types and amounts of cloth could take up to four days. Um, 
So you can see a heap of cloth here, and then we have our um, trader or explorer uh, hold up waiting for these talks to end. Burton failed actually to locate the source of the Nile because he had run out of cloth by the time he reached it. Uh, so our um, British and American uh, explorers are listing and describing these claws uh, not only for this reason, but they also wanted their home uh, manufacturers to imitate them, to produce them industrially. So they sent back the information for that reason too. Uh, we also have some export uh, records from Oman and from Kutch in India. Um, for uh, Muscat in particular, I have only found later um, records from 1880 and they are on wretched microfilm. Uh, but anyway, they do, of course, give us a lot of information. And you will see we have a line here for something called twist, and I will be returning to that later. Now, the records, uh, export records from India are much richer. As we know, for thousands of years, Western India exported cottons to Eastern Africa, but the sites of production and export changed over time. Um, historian Chaya Goswami has shown that from around 1800, weaving for Zanzibar and Madagascar shifted from central Gujarat to the port of Mandi, that's the star on the map, in this independent state of Kutch. And she traces this move to British and Mughal policy. Kutch's dynamic merchant groups who heavily invest in Eastern Africa, liberalization of textile trades, and the skill of Kutch's weavers themselves. Now, Chaya kindly shared with me this unpublished export list of 1851 to 54 um, from Mandi, uh, which had information that was not anywhere else available. Now, these export records, among other things, indicate that uh, Eastern Africa continued to import both unbleached and bleached cottons, um, even in the face of this strong industrial competition from the US and the UK, and in fact, in significant quantities. Now quickly, to control European sources, we have a few local language sources. Um, we have texts and monographs authored by Swahili and Yao historians, and they mention the same names um, as we saw on um, Speak and um, Stanley's lists. And they also refer to using these same types of cloths in uh, their transactions. And so do the official import uh, records of the Madagascar state for the port of Majanga. I can't overemphasize the importance of uh, 19th century dictionaries. They were often edited by missionaries who had been long residents in the region, or in the case of Madagascar, it was basically fully authored by six Malagasy scholars. Um, some of whom are recognized there. Um, and these dictionaries often give uh, good physical descriptions or also tell us about what the local uses and uh, social significance were, such as being used for ceremonial gifting or bride wealth. So altogether, our written sources um, give us uh, some good high level uh, understandings that uh, the handwoven luxury cloth came not only from India, but also from Oman. It gives us an idea on quantities, or at least the proportions of the different types, some of the fibers and colors that they came in, several qualities and sizes and colorways. And they help us to understand that luxury uh, was understood in terms of rich dyes, silk, gold thread, and complex stripes. And of course, as I pointed out, they give us the local names, and these names matter a lot. Um, but words alone fail to describe the cloth and to describe what uh, in local terms is the most important aspect of them, and that is the striping. Uh, many reports will just say things like striped in various ways and garnished with a border, which is pretty useless. That could describe just about anything. And it is these precise banding, striping, checks and plaids that actually give the cloth its name, its fame and its desirability. So then we come to using um, the actual cloth as sources. And I was actually a little surprised. I thought I would find hundreds of these because we know they were being imported 
uh, in the hundreds of thousands into Africa for many years, and they were made recently in the 19th century, uh, but I had greater difficulty than I expected. First, because actually very few of these textiles were collected by uh, the usual suspects by ethnographic museums where we might think to find them. Um, they were trade textiles. And so they weren't considered authentic, authentic ethnographic objects either in Africa or at their point of production uh, in the ports of Oman and India. So actually very few were collected by ethnographic museums. I did uh, find though uh, that a few made their way into German ethnographic museums. Uh, there are several in the uh, American Museum of Natural History and a few in Geneva's ethnographic museum. Um, but although these were not really valued as ethnographic works, they were valued as commercial samples. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Europeans were eager to imitate them. So the Europeans and Americans who went to Eastern Africa sent back hundreds, if not thousands, to their home countries, hoping that their manufacturers there would indeed imitate them. And most of these samples ended up in these colonial commercial museums, uh, museums that have long been forgotten, um, but at the time in the late 19th and early 20th centuries were some of the world's largest museums. However, however after World War II, um, these commercial museums largely fell into ruin and their bug infested contents, they contain you know, samples of cotton and local corn and dyes um, were tossed out together with a lot of the textiles. Um, one odd survivor um, is this precious Omani handwoven cloth that was transferred from Lille's commercial museum to its city museum. And mostly what I found uh, were not the handwoven Asian originals as you see here, but more often they were European industrial imitations, such as this Dutch made um, kerchief. Now these uh, industrial imitations cheat some of the handwoven effects, uh, but even so they contribute to our knowledge. So ultimately I studied um, collections in 15 museums in Europe and North America, finding a few in each. Now, most had no accompanying information at all, but I had a few rare pieces of luck. Uh, late in the game, I, find, I found these uh, samples that were collected by Stanley himself, which he neatly labeled with the cloth names Debwani and Suhari. And so quickly, what important information do we gain from the textiles themselves? Well, um, as I've mentioned several times, the all important disposition of the stripes um, bands and checks, because this is how uh, local consumer, consumers understood and assigned value. Uh, some examples of what Jeremy Prestolt has described about how even once these cloths reached Africa, they were um, redesigned and repurposed by local artisans, um, including by adding uh, locally adding beadwork and other embellishments. It shows um, that silks from uh, Western India were reaching uh, Eastern Africa. They don't tend to show up in any trade reports, um, but this piece from the Peabody Essex Museum, which is uh, what is known as mashu cloth, uh, a satin weave that combines cotton and silk. Um, this piece, you know, if we then link it to photographs, we can see that this was being used um, for headdresses by both men and women um, in uh, Eastern Africa. And we do know that it was being shipped out of Manviv, so we can use those sources um, to connect and see how it was reaching Eastern Africa. Finally, and importantly, it, it shows some of the techniques of uh, that industrial imitations could not replicate at the time. And prime among these was the this tapestry weave that, you know, the textile people among us uh, will understand this. Uh, but if you want to get these pure colors in your selvages, um, you need to switch up your weft using a tapestry link. And so you actually need all these spools of weft, which the weaver has to manipulate by throwing back and forth. And it, it really adds to the time, but to the beauty. And industrial manufacturers had a very difficult time uh, replicating this. Uh, so that's what the cloth can help us to see. Now for images, um, these, of course, are indispensable, but they must be used very 
critically and uh, they are difficult um, for various reasons. Um, now for the 19th century, we do have photographs, but photography before 1870 is actually very scarce and it tends to be only on the coasts. Postcards um, are especially suspect. Uh, oftentimes, you know, if we look at the one on the left, uh, that's from Madagascar. Um, this same woman, uh, we find her in various postcards dressed in different textiles. So the textiles were often props. And there's a tendency to use these postcards that actually date to around the around 1900 and try to project them back in time. Um, especially pres, uh, precious, you can see on the right are um, lithographs from uh, daguerreotypes by Charles Guillain from the 1840s, although he never left the coast. Um, and it's possible that the lithographs actually take great liberty with the actual daguerreotypes, which seem to have been very damaged. Um, Madagascar um, adds valuable images for uh, rare ones from the mid 1800s, especially this William Ellis um, collection. And um, just finally to say what has been another valuable uh, research method is um, field um, interviews, discussions with contemporary weavers. Um, in 2015, I had the opportunity for a pilot study in Kutch with contemporary textile artisans. And uh, they revealed that historical memory related to African exports was actually quite faint. Only silk mashu weaving continues today in the port of Mandi. And it's, it's not uh, necessarily for export. And the current weavers only learned the craft in the 1970s. Today's hereditary wool weavers of Kutch seem to have had no part in cotton export weaving. Rather, Manvi's weavers of the 19th century were migrant weavers, probably from Sin. And it seems that they moved on when the export business dried up in the 1870s. So uh, from this pilot study, it would appear that there is uh, very uh, little remaining oral histories around uh, that history of export. Now, Oman represents a very different situation and I express my gratitude to the Public Authority of Craft Heritage and to Julia Al-Zajali for their help in arranging my meetings with some of the few remaining older uh, weavers uh, who are still uh, pit loom weaving in Omani port towns. And many are direct descendants of 19th century weavers. Now they are still producing cloths of the same type that were exported to Zanzibar in the 19th century. So this was extremely useful in matching um, descriptions and older uh, samples to uh, names. I also was able to take a hand at weaving and um, I came to understand, you know, the efficiency and the flexibility of the pit loom, how you can have these preset warp threads and it's through the manipulation of the weft that you can upscale or downscale to adjust to fashions. Um, so uh, for the rest of my talk, what I'd like to do is then bring to life um, some of the major luxury textiles that were used in the 19th century East African trades. And I will uh, be going back and forth between these various sources. Now the Swahili in the 19th century called these luxury textiles uh, cloth, cloths with names. And before I come back to these hand-woven checks and stripes from Oman and India, uh, I'll just mention the three actually British industrial types of cloth um, that did manage to become classified as cloth with names and represented luxury or semi-luxury. And the first of these was uh, British factory-made broadcloth and bunting. British factory made woolens and cottons um, dyed in bright colors were uh, fantastically popular in the 19th century. But according to Rigby's uh, statistics of 1859, they only accounted for about 2.5% of the cloth imports. The popularity of uh, red bunting in particular may be tied to Europe's commercialization of turkey red dyes uh, in the mid 1800s, 
which created a red that did not fade in the tropics. So this density of color was a major appeal. Uh, there were some groups who called it the fire maker. Uh, for woolen broadcloth, which you see here, um, it did not ship directly from the UK, but via Bombay by Arab and Indian merchants. And broadcloth in Eastern Africa was appropriated for a wide variety of uses. On the coasts, Swahili and Arab men tailored it into vests and robes, as you see here. Some wealthy groups in the interior uh, desired it for uh, wearing it as body wrappers. Caravan leaders and guides wore the red broadcloth as a sign of their authority, and they might refuse to work if they did not receive gifts of it. And in Madagascar, finally, scarlet broadcloth was appropriated as royal capes. Two industrial cottons were classified as cloth with names. They are bleached cotton and printed cottons, which um, we've seen a bit of earlier. Now in Zanzibar, bleached cottons uh, cost twice the price of unbleached. And uh, textual reports tell us that by 1850, East African consumers generally preferred British bleached cottons over the Indian varieties. And cost was likely, you know, the major factor there. Until 1800, India's bleaching methods required only three months in comparison to European techniques that were much longer. Uh, in the late 1700s though, uh, France invented chemical bleach, which shortened the bleaching uh, project to just days and it caused the price to drop. All the same export lists from Manvi show that wealthy Arab and African merchants continued to import and patronize the finer Indian bleach cottons, primarily for their um, kanzu uh, tunics that you see here that are emblematic um, of Swahili dress at the time. And uh, the finer and wider the cloth, the more prestigious. So back to our printed cottons. Um, Several studies by Mackenzie Moon Ryan show that these conga cloths, as we know them today, emerged only in the 1870s. The design of these industrial prints that were made in the UK, the Netherlands, and Switzerland were co-productions between African women consumers, Indian merchants, and European industrial producers. Until the 1870s, however, these Indian Sorry, until the 1870s, it was really uh, Indian printed fabrics uh, that outcompeted them. Manvi export records from 1850s do list small amounts of printed cottons that were moving to Africa, whereas Zanzibar import records suggest that prints were coming primarily from Surat. And they were known by two names, Masutu and Kisutu. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Free Swahili women wore a pair of these Indian printed wrappers as their standard dress. And in the late 1840s, some 100,000 pieces were imported annually uh, from Western India. Now, hundreds of thousands were coming in, but to date I've only managed to find two handcrafted Indian examples. Um, and one does confirm a provenance in Surat. And uh, for you uh, who know uh, and study Eastern um, Indian Ocean textile trade, you will probably recognize uh, what you see here, the Kisutu cloth or elements of it. And that is, you can see that there are similarities to India's uh, Southeast Asian, maritime Southeast Asian trade in our sawtooth Tumphal borders, um, as well as this overall composition that resembles the, uh, the Sambagi which leads us to think that, of course, the producers in Western India were producing simultaneously for both Southeast Asia and uh, Eastern Africa. And it also shows that these Indian craftsmen were ahead of uh, European industrial manufacturers uh, in producing these uh, types for um, Zanzibar. In terms of the industrially printed conga cloths, um, they seem to have been primarily a urban coastal fashion uh, into the 1880s and something like only 4% uh, in value of the cloth being carried into uh, interior Africa were made up of conga cloth. 
And so last but not least are our handwoven striped and checkered cloths that were classified as cloths with names and make up the bulk of that category. Rather than prints, um, either the conga or the Indian handcrafted printed cloth, um, throughout the end of the 19th century and beyond, the most costly, luxurious, and popular of cloth with names were these hand-woven stripes and plaids. It was the striped cloth, according to a Yao historian, that made the heart of him that wore it full of joy, saying, now I am really well dressed. So to reiterate, these are cloths that are made uh, and patterned on the loom by the weaver. The Swahili glossed them with the general term kitambe, while Western trade literature uh, often calls them colored cloths, if you ever come across that term in the literature. And they are, of course, colorful versions of today's iconic Eastern African uh, kikoi. Arab and Swahili men wore them as hip wrappers, waist sashes, and turbans. And elite African and Arab women wore them as head cloths and shoulder wrappers. In the interior, meanwhile, people coveted them as waist or chest wrappers and to a lesser extent as turbans. They were gifted at births, weddings, funerals, and the investiture of rulers. Now, as I've mentioned, some styles came from Kutch and others came from Oman, and a few at some points in time were made in both places. So again, where Western authors tried to distinguish, you know, the very styles of cloth or understand a cloth name according to fiber or color, um, in fact, it is the striping patterns. Each specific striping pattern is associated with a specific name. So first of all, I'd like to uh, examine the, the so-called kutchy stripes that I have been able to identify. And this is how they're often referred to in the literature. Now matching museum objects um, to trade reports and other texts in this case was complicated by the fact that the names that they were given in Manvi uh, appear to almost always have been changed once they reached Eastern Africa and very few made their way into museums and none were ever labeled with striking names. Uh, even so, I believe I can put a face uh, to at least three of them. So what you see on the right um, was known as Tausiri or Tausiri in Manvi and Zanzibar in both of those places, whereas on the left, uh, what you see is what was known as the Barsati in Eastern Africa. Now, unfortunately, uh, these two types of cloth ranked among the least expensive and least prestigious of Kachi stripes. Uh, and so they uh, don't represent what would have been the finest hand weaving at the time. Now in Manvi, these cloths were generically called siakupra or black cloth, and you can see why their interiors were mostly black. Um, but if we look closely, we can actually see that they have um, small blue and black checkers, uh, which would have been added uh, investments on the part of the weaver. But for our purposes, what really matter are the red and yellow stripes, because that is what gave the cloths their name. Uh, in each instant, they are diff differently configured. So our Barsati on the left had the two uh, wide red stripes and the Tausiri meanwhile has these series of narrow red, yellow and blue at the selvages. Now they may look simple to us, um, but they are novel really in several ways that help us to understand why they were fashionable in Eastern Africa and how in some ways they were able to either outpace or outsmart industrial imitations. First, they were novel in terms of the yarn for the red and yellow stripes that you see here um, are actually not locally woven Indian yarn, uh, but they are industrial British yarns uh, that are called twist. Uh, Parta Sarati has shown that British mills from the 1820s aggressively exported industrially spun yarn 
It cost half the price of India's hand-spun cotton yarn. And this twist may have put many Indian hand spinners out of business, um, but it was a real boon to weavers. British mills also exported some of this twist pre-dyed in bright colors with new commercial turkey red and what I believe is cadmium yellow. These were cheaper and brighter colors than natural dyes. And it was these weavers in, in, in Kutch who were producing for Africa who were the first in Western India to embrace this British industrial colored thread. Uh, and by doing so, they were able to experience growth and success at a time when weavers in other parts of Western India, according to Douglas Haynes, were in fact in decline, losing business. And again, while the patterns may look simple to us, uh, the tapestry, tapestry joins to create these bright selvage colors in the finer cloth were difficult to, re, uh, to replicate industrially. So as Roy has pointed out more generally for India, it was textiles with fancy borders and ends that remained the monopoly of hand weavers. A third kutchi stripe or plaid that I have identified uh, is one that actually came in at the lowest price point, And it's what the Swahili called kunguru, which means crow. Uh, and it had these large checks and no tapestry weave. So without the tapestry weave, it was much faster to weave. I haven't been able to find any handwoven version. All I have found are industrial imitations like the one you see here. Now, uh, Burton in his writings tell us that this was the type of cloth that was especially favored by the Maasai. And so it is likely, uh, in fact, quite certain that it was this kutchi plaid that is at the origin of the famous Maasai plaids that are still worn today. Now the very highest end of Indian, uh, Western Indian weavings uh, for Zanzibar um, remains still a bit of a mystery. Uh, I believe this is what was the Dooley cloth. And this was one that was most desired uh, up until about 1860 or 70 by uh, rulers in interior Africa. It was all of silk and uh, was produced in Surat. And I believe this is an example of it. I've got some anecdotal information to say it is. And this uh, is in the Peabody Essex Museum of Salem. And you can see how it differs from the earlier pieces in terms of the more complex design and the richer colors and finishes. Now the text tell us that by 1878, uh, Manvi's weaving for Eastern Africa had greatly declined. And uh, this is usually attributed to questions of the port infrastructure and British policy, but there was also uh, the fact that uh, these kachi stripes were facing a lot of competition from Oman's own hand weaving. Uh, it seems to be largely forgotten that in the 19th century, uh, the port towns of Oman were also uh, weaving large amounts of textiles for export to Eastern Africa. And this is the muscat cloth that appears in Zanzibar import records. My analysis shows that over half the cloth with names imported into Zanzibar um, and traded throughout Central Eastern Africa were hand woven in Oman. Now you will know that Oman in the late 1600s uh, became a, uh, ejected the Portuguese from several uh, critical ports in the Gulf and became a regional political and commercial power. In the 1700s, the new Al Usaidi dynasty intensified Omani merchant activities on the Swahili coast, uh, appointing governors in key port towns. Finally, in 1832, the Sultan of Oman moved his capital to Zanzibar and thereafter, thereafter funneled all international trade with the East African mainland through Zanzibar. Omani merchants became active traders deep into interior Africa. And so it is not surprising that Omani dress inspired new aspirational fashions in Eastern Africa, especially with elite Swahili men. And this included not only the tailored garments that you see here, but also these uh, ample turbans, the waist sashes and the hip wrappers that you can't see. Now, at the same time, Oman was ramping up its own fashion industry. 
from the eight, from the 1700s, Muscat and other Omani part, ports emerged as major emporia. And as other uh, emporia in the Indian Ocean, they developed export weaving uh, in all of these port cities that you see here. And here too, as in uh, Western India, Omani weavers worked at pit looms using both imported and local fibers and dyes. They produced lengths of uh, both check cotton and silk. And uh, as far as numbers go, from what I've been able to see in the 1840s, they were exporting at least 100,000 pieces annually to Zanzibar. And this number may have risen to as many as 400,000 uh, by the 1890s. Now here are a few examples and to our eyes, they may look similar to kachi striped cottons, um, but they were distinct in several ways that I think you can see. Also, the, the colors are different. Uh, our striping, banding, and checks are different. They tend to have uh, blue and white checks at the center. Uh, many of them have the same names in uh, Oman that they have in Zanzibar, including the Rehani, the Sabuni, the Sohari, and Subaiya. And some striping styles were actually named for uh, Omani ports, including Kariati, Suweki, and the Suhari. But Omani weavers also made cloths um, just for uh, export to Africa. Um, so they were um, producing for niche markets. That includes the Debwani, which you see here. And it is distinctive for these blue and white stripes and also these tan stripes that are made of Oman's naturally brown cotton. Here is the style that was known as the Baruadzi, and you can see also uh, that it is quite different. Uh, we have bold black and white stripes at the center, and then these very lively and bright border stripes in silk on the side. And um, this is one of the reasons that I believe Oman, uh, towards the later 19th century, was able to outcompete um, the Manvi cottons in that Oman itself had come to control the Gulf trade in Bombex silk, and this was an advantage for its weavers. So according to many of the reports and even some of the images that I see, you can see that there were substantial sections of these cloths made in silk. Uh, finally, and this is really to conclude my presentation, um, another special touch that uh, Omani weavers gave the cloth were these woven end bands um, called uh, taraz. And as far as I've been able to tell, um, they were only added to um, Omani made cloths, uh, not to the Western Indian made cloths. Uh, some were made in Oman before being shipped out, but more often this end band was added in Africa itself by specialized uh, braid loom weavers, as you can see here, who would weave these uh, bands on uh, to the end of the cloth as a special finish. And that brings us back to Madagascar, because uh, during the same period, that is when Madagascar uh, hand weavers also begin to include these uh, end bands onto their cloth in what then was uh, a regional um, fashion um, system. So we have the design and the techniques circulating throughout. And just to really end, here is what was finally, uh, how the Dutch finally figured out how to industrially imitate these woven end bands and uh, how complex the mach machinery was if we compare it to our man with a simple uh, braid loom. This is what it took to industrially imitate these uh, woven end bands. So that really ends my presentation. Um, I know there were uh, a lot of trees. I hope there was still enough forest um, to put this uh, story all together. Um, just to say that um, there was an interlude. So what I presented was really the first part of uh, my research project. I'm now going forward, um, going to be taking it up again after the interlude with the Indian Chintz project uh, and completing it. And part of that is to look at uh, the port weaving of Yemen and Somalia at the same time. So that will be a next step. So I would appreciate any questions, feedback, um, ideas. 
it is, um, as many people know, uh, a very difficult project to undertake um, these uh, global trade stories. And these are just a few of the people uh, I need to thank um, for bringing me to where I am now. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that lovely, lovely, lovely presentation. Um, I'm still soaking in um, all the all the textile images from the presentation. Um, I'm going to invite Christian to uh, now um, first introduce, in, you know, to the idea of the questions that we have uh, in our minds already, but uh, and, and also to present some of her thoughts on the on the uh, on the paper that Sarah just uh, presented. Um, if you have questions, all of the participants, please put it in the Q and A, and then we hopefully can get to some of them um, after Kristen's presentation. Kristen, thank you, Deepthi, and thank you so much, Sarah, for that incredible presentation. I don't know that I have much of a, a presentation except some thoughts that. Um, were sort of circling around in my head as you were um, sharing with us all of this rich material. Um, and I think a theme that's, that's certainly been going throughout this series is, is sort of multiple origins of objects and the sort of entangled um, or sort of hybrid production of things. Um, and, you know, that certainly struck me with both the movement of textiles from say Mangui or from Oman to the eastern coast of Africa, but also thinking about the uh, both the industrial materials as well as the sort of handmade techniques that that are used in both. Um, there was there are a couple of things that you briefly mentioned in this in your talk here that also you speak a little bit more about in your um, your publications on the cloths with names um, that I was hoping you could sort of uh, expand upon. Um, there, and, and one question that came up in the chat that, that also I think um, relates. Uh, the first is, you know, you, you focused on Gujarat and I know you, you've talked about um, other sources in India where these textiles have come, I believe it's after 1885, um, but there was a question in the chat about um, sort of why only Gujarat, why are these things only come from Manvi? Um, but I know you've mentioned Punjab, Sin, maybe even Madras. And so if you can speak to that a little bit, that would be, uh, I think enlightening. Um, you also briefly mentioned the gifting practices or practices of exchanging these textiles in Eastern Africa. Um, and I, I was hoping you could expand on that as well. Is this, are these practices of khilat, of sort of, you know, similar to kind of robes of honor. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about the, the sort of social significance of gifting and exchange with these, um, these textiles, that would be, I think, really wonderful. Um, and then I really want to look at those photographs, those what you've used as documentary photographs. I don't know if we've got the time DP, to go back and look at images, but I kept flagging some of these really fascinating um, 19th century photographs that you're using. And I, for me, what's so interesting about them is the way that they sort of change sort of our understanding or the visual effect of the stripes themselves, right? And I know you, you talked about in your talk and, and you mentioned in your publication, how important the stripes were versus say supplementary, um, you know, sort of geometric or figurative patterning. Um, but it seems to me that the stripes look so very different when they're worn and they're wrapped and they're layered um, with other kinds of patterns. Um, so I was hoping we might be able to like look at some of those together if we have time. So um, those are some of my initial thoughts. I know there's a lot there, but, um, but I think all of us would like to hear more from you. Um, Certainly. So, so the first part is to understand um, the, the places in India that were um, uh, exporting. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to come up with a short answer. Um, I, I think we all know that for thousands of years, there's evidence of India, you know, exporting to to Eastern Africa. Back to the Periplus, we have descriptions of the types of cloths that were moving to the Horn of Africa, um, and this has been one of my frustrations. Uh, I'll be honest, mostly where I've been presenting my work earlier was with historians and they are happy to a certain extent with just the word cloth or just in other places with just the word India. So what I was trying to show is that um, in the 19th century, really it became concentrated and cut to the export um, to Eastern Africa. There were other types that were being um, drawn from other parts of India and even what was coming out of Mandi 
uh, the unbleached cottons that I mentioned that continued to uh, be exported were actually coming from Rajasthan. So in some ways, uh, Mandi was just a, a funnel for other types of cloth coming from other parts of India. Um, but the, the ones that were focused on the cloth with names, we're quite sure they were being woven in the port town of Mandi themselves. But there were other specialty fabrics. Um, we hear of Kes, we hear of Jamdani, uh, that tended to be consumed in Zanzibar itself, probably by diasporic um, Omani and Indian populations. But there's really no record that I can find of it um, being part, you know, being carried into Central uh, Eastern Africa and becoming part of those traditions. I think a lot of them were just for the, the urban port dwellers. Um, and then, of course, if you go to the century before the 18th century, uh, it's really these Portuguese networks that are drawing from really um, uh, southern and central Gujarat. That's really who's supplying in the 18th century. Um, and then the 19th century, specifically to Zanzibar, it does shift to that part. But as I say, they are in some ways still including uh, textiles um, drawn from other parts. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because that's was... incredibly complicated. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's true in, in the publication, I go a bit more in, into those um, into those details of the other types of Indian cloths that we have evidence for that we're also moving there. Um, so next question. Um, <laughs> it's about gifting and exchange. Gifting, the gifting is really the, the fun part of the story and it's amazing. Um, all, you know, why, why would, um, you know, people go to the effort of collecting all these local natural products, you know, hunting elephant ivory, it's, it's incredibly dangerous. Why would you do this? Um, and it was, you know, in order, and, and people do uh, say this in the 19th century, so we can get the cloth. And what did they want the cloth for? A lot of it was for bride wealth. Um, you know, to this day, presentations of textiles need to be made to the bride's family uh, at the time of wedding. So you need to be able to stockpile these luxury cloths for that. There were also a lot of trade um, rituals that required cloth. So if you had um, a caravan originating from interior Africa, it would stop outside of Zanzibar and all the different merchants in Zanzibar would set out representatives with huge piles of cloth to try to entice those ivory caravans to come to them in the city. So they would outcompete themselves, try to outcompete each other, you know, by offering, you know, dozens, hundreds. Uh, my understanding is that for the investiture of um, Swahili rulers, um, there are gifts that are called turbans and they have to be made by um, both allies and in turn from that person back to the community. And it's my understanding that um, the ruler of Mombasa had to make a gift of cloth to every newborn child, as well as at times of marriages. So cloth was everywhere uh, in the ritual life of communities, whether in the coast or in the interior. And in Madagascar, we know for burials, anywhere upwards of 200 cloths are required. So people had um, strong um, motivation to, to acquire these. And is the, I mean, it sounds, um, they, that's, no, it's absolutely fascinating. And what I'm sort of wondering about too is, I mean, the sort of the sartorial practices you mentioned, the different sort of, in terms of sort of gender distinctions, women wearing certain kinds of cloth and men wearing certain kinds of cloth. Um, and some of those choices um, seem to tie in with that, with this context of exchange and gifting. Do we, um, is it easy to look at some of those documentary photos to sort of pivot back to share your screen? If not, we can sure. talk sure, about sure. it in the abstract, but there were just, you know, you, the, I, you know, some of the, the photographs that you included, I think um, the women in Zanzibar with the mushroom, sort of with the turbans, um, or there was also the, the man in Madagascar with the, I think that's a photograph from, from your, from the ROM collection. Um, this one, can we go back to that image actually? <laughs> that, so this is so interesting to me when I looked at this, as so I was sort of thinking about the sort of visual effect of wearing these stripes and what happens, um, you know, they, they appear so different when we see them um, nicely photographed as sort of 
flat uh, rectangular objects. Um, but, but the way in which when people are wearing them, whether these are staged photographs or not, um, the, the effect of the stripe is so very different, um, which really makes me think about the sort of, uh, the sort of intention of, of the weaver and then the, the sort of choices of the, of the wearer. But this photograph here, it almost looks like the, the, you know, the stripe doesn't line up. So are, is this two, two pieces of, of woven fabric that have been pieced together? Yeah, and this is something I probably should have explained from the beginning. You know, what, what came off the loom um, normally, so it's, it's, it's rare narrow. for us to find the whole piece, which we see here on the left, which is actually the two lengths stitched together. What okay. comes off the loom is, uh, is a half length, and then it has to be stitched together. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so what comes off the loom is what you see here. You've got to weave two of these and then stitch them together symmetrically. So, um, and oftentimes weavers, um, at least uh, in Oman, they, they just work from memory. So things don't always really entirely match um, because they'll just weave what, what they think and they've got to weave the next length and they don't always uh, completely match up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, those are the, the wonderful places where they don't match up or are oftentimes so beautiful. Um, can we look at some of the other photographs? There was, um, I, there was a couple of later photographs you had of the uh, the image of the Devwani and the Barawazi or the, those three young women in Zanzibar with the turbans. I just wanted, yeah, this is such a great image. I, I guess I, what, what for me is so interesting is how this photograph, the kind of information this photograph gives us about the textiles um, so the, the musher then is the turban itself, is that what? That's right. Okay. Um, so then they're wearing other kinds of cloths with names on, wrapped on yeah. their bodies? Actually, these aren't cloths with names. I, I skipped over this, but you know, the, the British, the only British industrial cloths, they were mostly rejected. Um, the only ones that were accepted were broadcloth and were what uh, appears the word chintz in the records, and it was yardage. It was simple, these uh, simple prints with stripes um, and florals. So but this more, is more like the British printed. More printed, sorry. More printed, printed, yeah. Okay. More like the British uh, printed cloth. Okay. And, and they say it was worn mostly uh, for women as tunics. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, I just think it's so, you know, when I, when I see this, you know, in thinking about your methodology, it just strikes me that photographs like this are also give us some really interesting information about how, certainly how they're being worn as you're using, but also the effect of those stripes, like the effect of the pattern as they're wrapped um, in turbans or as they're wrapped around the body, um, which gives us different kinds of textile information um, than, than the, the lovely images that you have on the left. Yeah, uh, and, and, and just how also how people created fashion because it was often yeah. in the draping style that even if you had the same cloth, um, the draping ways of tying and wrapping would change. So that, that's a huge part of, of the fashionability story. Yeah. And, you know, and I've got to say, when I saw this piece on the left in the Peabody Essex Museum, I didn't know what it was and I just you know, skipped over it. And it was only later uh, reading about um, the turbans worn by women would have these head straps on them that I realized, you know, what it was. So um, without the photographs, yeah, I, I don't know if um, I would have understood it. Yeah, no, it's it's wonderful. Um, Deepthi, how are we on time? I we're, Are we, we supposed to be done? <laughs> we, we, we should be wrapping up. So I'm just going to bring one question from the Q&A to Sarah, and then we can wrap up if that's okay with both of you, I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions. Um, if you do have very pressing questions that you want to ask Sarah and you leave them in the q and I promise I will send it to Sarah and try to get <laughs> an answer for you. Um, so uh, Ananya Kabir asked just earlier um, that she says, this is such an amazing treat to see these rich textiles. Could you please tell us your views on why checks are so favored in this global taste making story? That is a really tough one. And I would love all of us to put our heads together from all of these talks and, and talk about that. We saw so many checks and plaids in the last presentation. Um, on the one hand, they are just the easiest embellishment to do on the loom. You know, they do involve the, the, the least amount of um, labor um, to do them. But I've also seen, and uh, it was by a, a pair of 
um, African art historians, and I only know their last names, Parani and Wolf. I can't recall their first names at the moment. Uh, have this wonderful um, uh, line about how they how they frame the body, and in many parts of the world, it's actually the human body that is considered the, the real thing of beauty. So what the checks and stripes do is they um, they they frame it um, and they accentuate um, its forms. So that is the best explanation that I have found for a general sense. Uh, I have never seen anything um, out of this literature that says why um, stripes and plaids were so favored, um, but definitely in this case, um, they were favored over anything figurative um, for uh, a very long time. And I suppose it could also relate to that. I'm just thinking back to a lecture I saw by Ruth Barnes yesterday, who is comparing the types of painted and printed cottons from India that went to Southeast Asia and those that went to Cairo. And the Cairo ones are hardly ever figurative, uh, which she believes is, you know, partly because of the Islamic presence and um, the disinclination to have figurative images. So that might uh, be part of the story. And of course, it's what local weavers have been making from time immemorial to the stripes and the plaids. So uh, the imports are going to often replicate what was already being, being made on site. Um, Sarah, you, your sound kind of dropped out a little bit there, but I think if you had pushed up the volume, we could all hear her. Um, um, Kristen, it, can, do you have any more questions or? Well, maybe I mean, I have a lot more questions, but I, but I also know that, that <laughs> like, I'm going to be turning into a pumpkin and I'm sure this also needs to end soon. Um, but it does, you know, the, uh, I'm the, this question about stripes and plaids is so interesting and and the sort of classic example is, you know, the Lipakshi murals, right, which is where, where checks and stripes appear so prominently in depictions of textiles, right, from the 16th century. So it's, it's certainly not just the case from Punjab or these mushroom from Manvi, but they were so popular in so many parts of the subcontinent. Um, but really fascinating um, discussion and, and wonderful food for thought. So Thank you so much. Thank you for including me. Yeah, thank you so much, Kristen, for the moderation. Thank you, Sarah, um, so much for speaking and bringing all these textiles to us. I Before everyone goes, I wanted to say next week is our final talk of the series. Um, um, it's by Urmila Mohan, who is uh, going to talk about curating Balinese and probably more broadly about Indonesian, text, uh, Indonesian textiles, not Indian Ocean, Indonesian textiles. Um, so we're going to concentrate on textiles, but on the Eastern Indian Ocean world um, and probably bring it into the contemporary and think about issues of display and collection of these textiles, um, which have their own sort of checkered and problematic history. So um, please come back uh, next week and, you know, we'll end uh, the series with uh, in the Eastern Indian Ocean world. Um, thank you so much for joining. The speakers are going to hang around for a bit for like a cooling down session. Um, you're welcome to join us, but thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see you next Thursday.